So just to begin with uh, some uh, framework, so we know what uh, we're discussing now. Uh, first, I'll just have a word about the motivation for this study. Uh, then just the, uh, the big picture, the current international financial regulation framework. Uh, some of the principal crisis issues, just to review, set things in context. Then I'll look in some detail at uh, the role of the central banks and the issues of financial regulation with respect to them. Um, the Basel framework is uh, pretty uh, closely related to the central bank side, so we'll look at that. Um, there are some caveats I'd like to raise, um, and then a further look at uh, Basel in the context of the caveats, and then just uh, to uh, zoom out to the very big picture, which is the G20 framework, and then some concluding comments, and then I'll leave you with some bedtime reading. Um, so just to review really what you already know, the hierarchical structure of the current uh, framework, uh, there's three levels really. There's the top level, which is the G20, the finance ministers, central bank governors. Um, this is where the high level assessment and international agreements take place. The second level um, is where the international institutions sit in, the IMF, the relatively more recent Financial Stability Board, they're primarily concerned with the thematic analysis and the overview and review functions. The third level is the SSBs, the standard setting bodies. These are the uh, Basel Committee, we'll talk about in a bit, Committee on Global Financial System, Payments and Market Structures, Insurance Supervisors, Accounting Standards, and EOSCO with uh, Securities Commissions. And then all of these have some form of subgroups working parties to deal with specific issues when they drill down. And then the um, fourth level is an example in the UK would be the PRA, the National Regulatory and Legislative Issues they deal with. Um, motivation really, um, although we've heard that the um, centre has done some very good work on the history of financial crises, there is a sense in which um, the great financial crisis has been unique in regulatory reform terms and my um, starting point is that it really is a bit of a watershed in terms of the regulatory reform it's generated and will continue to and that in that sense the international financial regulation scene is not going to be the same again. Um, now very briefly as we know um, it's a very complex situation um, a key point uh, today I would want to make is that um, it's still relatively unresolved, a lot going on all the time. Um, if we just turn to review some of the crisis issues in more detail, um, is a very wide range of issues now uh, are presenting themselves at the widest level, um, and it's easy to overlook this, um, there's had to be an overall identification of the major regulatory weaknesses and associated required reforms. Um, it's also been important to think about how to achieve a viable multinational, multisectoral reform process and optimise the structures of the regulatory responsibilities of the international agencies. Risk management has had to be reviewed, governance, valuation and disclosure, Prudential regulation, which is micro and macro, including with respect to bank capital requirements, liquidity regulation, insurance, fund management, consumer protection, resolution arrangements, contingent capital, the too big to fail issue, CIFIs and GCIFIs, capital and securities markets, reporting, market practices, margin requirements, haircuts, securitization, the list goes on, credit derivatives, structured finance products, and then the real the real politic practice of the supervisory process itself post the crisis. Now just to review, as we know, the weaknesses that the crisis uh, highlighted uh, include the excess supply of leverage, too little high quality capital funding bank assets, excess credit growth, fueled in part by weak underwriting standards, and an underpricing of credit and liquidity risks, a high degree of systemic risk, interconnectedness amongst financial institutions and common exposure to similar shocks, inadequate capital buffers for banks to mitigate the inherent pro-cyclicality of financial markets and to maintain lending to the real economy during stress episodes, insufficient liquidity buffers, 
excessive exposures to liquidity risk, both direct and indirect, for example, through the shadow banking system. So this, at the widest level, the general purpose of financial regulation post the crisis is the, require, is, is the requiring influencing of bank behaviour and other financial intermediaries to improve resilience and financial stability. Um, now, we'll talk a bit about central banks. Um, the issue here is that they have a unique role, uh, so they require special attention. Um, all these financial intermediaries interact with central banks in the context of monetary policy implementation. So in terms of the international regulation side, changes in regulation frameworks will generate effects which central banks have to take into account. So this is why I want to look at them. They're right at the apex of the financial pyramid and have taken on, as we know, so much more significance post the crisis. So this is my starting point for looking at the perspectives on regulation um, today as they're the first responders, really, uh, when a crisis breaks. Um, as monetary policy responses lie at the core of their operations, as an example today, we'll look at the impact of regulatory change on monetary policy um, to derive some specific insights into the regulation financial crisis space. So to contextualise, first of all, with some background, what are the financial regulatory questions arising with respect to central banking? Weaknesses in the pre-crisis framework brought into question, as we know, its very fundamental rationale. So this produced a specific set of issues for the central banking community, including, and these are just illustratively, in relation to the key international regulatory initiatives likely to affect central bank monetary policy implementation, the channels through which these would be expected primarily to operate, how key markets would be affected, and the nature of the feedback mechanisms into monetary policy frameworks, the differences, if any, in the significance of these effects across jurisdictions, financial systems, and importantly here, alternative monetary policy frameworks, which the central banks operate, the reasons for these differences, and whether they vary across stress periods as against normal periods, and the specific features of monetary frameworks likely to be appropriate for the emerging regulatory regime. So what we must ask ourselves may be useful in terms of financial regulation for the central banks themselves. In an ideal world, the likely impacts of new financial regulation on financial institutions and markets will have manageable effects for central banks on their monetary policy operations and transmission. So they can make adjustments within existing policy frameworks to retain effectiveness, especially under the pressures, the day-to-day -day pressures of crisis conditions. What are then the impacts of some key new financial regulations on central bank monetary operations? What shape do they take and what insights can we gain and what can we take away as their possible effects? So in terms of potential economic effects of the financial regulatory reform on central bank operations, if we just review again, um, the enhanced bank resilience with emphasis on stronger bank capital and liquidity cushions reduced funding mismatches and better balanced bank funding profiles suggest to us that potential contagion and spillover risk from financial sector to the real economy may be better mitigated. Emerging financial landscapes may now tend to exhibit lower frequency and intensity of booms and busts and hence less demand for central bank intervention. New financial regulation may also make it more expensive for banks to take on liquidity and solvency risks reducing the quantity of liquidity and supplies of maturity transformations. On the assumption that regulations are effective, at some point in the credit cycle, the supply of bank credit for the non-financial sector will tend then to be lower than without the regulations. If not counterbalanced by developments outside the banking sector itself, central banks may have then to adopt a more accommodative policy stance during some parts of the cycle than otherwise. Nevertheless, with cycles expected to be less frequent and severe due to lower incidence of major disruptions, the supply of bank credit should be more stable over time than otherwise without the new regulations. And this in itself can be an expectation-raising factor that the, financial, that the regulation effect may be crisis-reducing. Another potential impact of post-crisis financial regulations relates to changing equilibrium relationships between asset prices and policy rates. 
As start dates for new regulations pass or draw closer, equilibrium relationships between financial asset prices and between those prices and central bank policy rates will shift. These shifts may be small, but they may tend to require a central bank to adjust its policy rate or some other intermediate policy target, say bank system liquidity, to achieve <coughs> the same outcome. Yet while these effects of individual new regulations on asset prices and rates may to some extent be predictable, different regulations may generate sets of consequences moving in opposite directions, making it difficult to predict the net effects and even manifestations of the infamous economic law of unintended consequences. So the existing uncertainty surrounding these asset price relationships may rise during the transition period to the new equilibrium, and as a result, central banks will need to monitor key market metrics uh, very carefully and respond to any observed changes. The um, new liquidity re regulations may increase the demand for reserve balances and types of high-quality liquid assets and short-term loans relative to less liquid assets and longer-term loans. One consequence could be that turnover in different money market segments changes so that the central bank may seek to switch its operational target variable to an instrument less affected by such market changes. A related implication is that the new financial regulations may result in a reduction in the ease and thus the quantity of certain types of arbitrage activities across financial markets. This reduction may weaken and make more uncertain the links between policy and other rates, in turn weakening transmission of monetary impulses affecting real economic activity. Also, regulatory effects on arbitrage may mean that central banks, to achieve the monetary conditions they desire, may, seek, may need to adjust operations to deliver the interest rate levels or relevant asset prices deemed appropriate. They could, for instance, widen the set of counterparties with whom they operate so that transmission between their policy rates and other financial asset prices become less reliant on arbitrage between counterparties and other financial institutions. Equally, central banks could just leave operations largely unchanged, instead anticipating rather longer and more variable lags between policy decisions and the associated changes in economic activity. Another potential implication of new financial regulation is that they may make it more difficult to forecast the demand for reserve balances. Illustratively, if the central bank is conducting monetary policy in such a way that the interest rate paid on reserve balances is close to that on other forms of high quality liquid assets, small changes in interest rates could generate relatively large movements in reserve demand as banks substitute yes, already. Oh, we've only just started we've only just started as banks substitute <laughs> between reserves and other types of high quality reserve assets. New limits on counterparty concentration mean that predictions of the level of reserve balances may depend more strongly than previously on the distribution of those reserves across counterparties, especially in jurisdictions where money markets are dominated by small numbers of very large banks. Now, depending on their operational framework, central banks may respond to such a heightened difficulty in reserve balance prediction in a number of ways, including to dampen interest rate variability moving to an alternative framework which does not require such precise projections or allows for more reserve averaging so that daily differences between the level of reserves supplied and the demand for reserves result in more muted interest rates movements. They could also decide to tolerate greater volatility in market rates by switching to a range rather, rather than to a point for its intermediate target. Another implication of aspects of the new financial regulations is that they may increase the tendency of banks to rely on the central bank as an intermediary in financial markets. This would derive from the weakened in arbitrage incentives we referred to and the reserve balance prediction, prediction issue, uh, leading central banks to widen operations to achieve policy objectives. Also, in certain cases, the new regulations may work to treat financial interactions with the central bank more favourably than with private counterparties. In these circumstances, the central bank faces a choice. It can accommodate the increased tendency to intermediate or it can resist. In practice, the choice will depend on the pros and cons each particular jurisdiction sees in having an augmented role for its central bank in financial intermediation and also on how easily 
the existing operations framework can be adjusted to incorporate further incentives against increased reliance on the central bank as an intermediary. Central banks also need to factor into their monetary policy formation process how their interactions with the banks impact upon the effectiveness of the regulatory requirements process itself. And in this context, one issue may be whether a particular regulation treats central bank operations and identical operations with private counterparties the same. If not, then central banks may find themselves unwittingly undermining the objectives and purposes of a particular regulation. A related issue here is that central banks may observe a tendency for new liquidity regulation to make banks with less favourable initial regulatory ratios expand their central bank borrowing while using non-high quality liquid assets as collateral, as these banks crowd out others with stronger initial regulatory ratios. The central bank may wish then as a policy objective to limit the increase in concentration of its lending towards more regulatory constrained banks which may result from this behaviour. So those are just a few examples of the potential implications, economic effects of financial regulations on central banking activity, which we may need to factor in in our assessment of what's going on around us. Um, we might um, point out here actually currently that there's a question, there's the notion we had some years ago of peak oil, well currently too, and ask the question whether we are at or near or even beyond the point of peak independence in terms of central bank mandates themselves and speculate on what this might mean for an expected path of future financial regulation, an implication for the management out of an exit strategy from a future financial crisis. In fact, hints about this are already around with, for instance, the Fed capping aspects of its activity. If the crucial crisis-busting twin filler functions of monetary policy and financial stability have to be executed in a more constrained, less independent global central bank community of practice. How might this look for our private sector bottom line? Um, if we're out of time, I'll stop there, if that's okay with you.